Good to go. I'm ready. Getting the squish. There we go. I had it a worked pop before. Up. I had a pop up that Those was the worst. I had to get through first. There we go. All, All right. right. So thanks everybody for having me here tonight. I really appreciate being able to come and talk about my work. Um as you know, I've been well, first of all, some of you know me and some of you. I spend a lot of time, or did spend a lot of time, at hunting in the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal at Reedy Point. And as Matthew mentioned, it's no longer viable because uh, it belongs to the Army Corps of Engineers. And they decided that they were going to do something else with the land. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So, come on. Why is this not? It's not scrolling. There we go. There we go. There we go. So this is the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. It was built by the Army Corps of Engineers and opened up for business in 1829. It started off 10 feet deep, 66 feet wide, and 14 miles long, running from Chesapeake City, Maryland, to Delaware City, Delaware. Kind of redundant, but hey, you can find it on the map, right? Um, the idea was to have a shortcut between Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington, D.C., because it was a long way around to take a boat all the way around the peninsula to get to Baltimore or Philadelphia. It really cut the time down. And it became a really, really important canal. It's actually one of the most, one of the busiest canals on the East Coast right now. After a whole bunch of improvements between then and now, the canal is now 450 feet wide and 35 feet deep. Now, what did the Air Corps of Engineers do with all of that dirt? If I can, it's not. Oh, hey, there we go. Okay, so when the Corps of Engineers dredges the canal to make it bigger, deeper, wider, better, accommodating bigger and bigger ships, they end up dumping it on the land that they purchased all along the canal banks. And they dumped it. This is what the canal used to look like all up and down the canal after the last really big dredge in 1980. This is Reedy Point North a few years ago. Uh, there was an there were spots at Reedy Point on both sides of the canal, along the St. George's Bridge, along the Summit Bridge, and then everywhere in between. This is what it like looks like today. Same spot. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers decided that they needed to dredge an area around Port Mahon, which is close to Dover, Delaware. And in order to do that, they needed to scoop out all of my lovely fossiliferous sand and uh, flood it. So now it is a really, really nice wetland. But then they're going to fill it in again with the dredge material from Port Mahon. And the best I can figure out, it's not going to be the right kind of material. It's not going to be fossiliferous. One can always hold their breath and hope. But if it is, it's probably going to be from a different formation than the stuff that I was collecting until recently. So this is one of the fossils that I found lying in the sand. Back in the day, before 1980, you could actually go out to the canal and wade out and just pick stuff up where it fossilized. And it was really, really awesome. And I totally missed it because I was still a kid then. Um, 
we won't discuss the fact that a lot of you probably weren't even born then. <laughs> but um, everybody ends up with a case of born too late when you end up dealing with paleontology because sites are always closing. So my collecting was in the spoils pile that they dumped on, on the banks. Excuse me. I don't know what's going on today. Uh, so the, the, the fossils at the site are from the upper Cretaceous, somewhere between 68 and 72 million years ago, right around the tail end of the dinosaurs. It was all marine. This area was actually a sandbar, something like 30 miles from the shore. Really, really shallow. The shell you see here is probably about an inch long. And that was, for the most part, as big as they got at this site. Uh, everything that was bigger than that were things that could either bury themselves under the sand so the water depth wasn't really an issue, or things like shark teeth and mosasaur bones that ended up washing up onto the sandbar at some point during a storm or whatever and got buried in the sand. This is Sophie Holmesy. She was considered Delaware's first woman naturalist at uh, <laughs> a rather late stage of the game. She was, it was obviously, she lived, in, just passed away a couple of years ago. She was primarily considered an ornithologist. She was very, very heavily into the birding community in Delaware, but she was also a really avid fossil hunter. And she spent so much time collecting thousands and thousands and thousands of specimens from one spot along the CND Canal, which is known as the Biggs Farm. The Biggs Farm ended up getting dredged along with everything else in 1980, and most of that stuff ended up on the spoils pile. So we don't, the stuff that we collect in the spoils pile, because it isn't located, isn't where it fossilized. We can't always be 100% sure of exactly where it fit into the different layers that, that underlie the canal. But because she picked everything out of the layer before it was dredged, she collected an incredible amount of information about what the world was like in this little sandbar. She was a member of the Monmouth Amateur Paleontological Society, which is for, it's an amateur organization based in New Jersey that amassed probably one of, not one of, it is probably the single most thorough collection of fossils from the Atlantic Coastal Plain anywhere. And that includes the New Jersey State Museum. It is just an incredible collection <laughs> housed in somebody's basement. But Sophie, by herself, managed to amass what is hands down the most thorough collection from a single locality anywhere on the Atlantic Coastal Plain, definitely in the canal. Just absolutely incredible. Shortly before she passed away, she donated most of her collection, her notes, her photographs, everything she, she did to detail her collection so that she could put together a book that never got finished. She donated this to the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science. You can see here, she had some really incredible drawings. I don't know, can you see my cursor there? Yep, we can see it. Okay. She just had these incredible little drawings, and these were just for her notes. And every bit of details about how to identify everything, where she found the information, every bit of the taxonomic string that she could come up with for the fossils that she managed to identify. Hmm. 
Next slide. Here we go. Unfortunately, most of it ended up coming out like this in bags full of unsorted stuff. And you see this cabinet here, that's about two thirds of what she donated. The other third I've thankfully gotten through, but it's taken me five years to do it. <laughs> And this is some of the stuff that she donated. Absolutely gorgeous gastropod here. This is a cephalopod beak. This is this is the mouth part for an ancient squid. This is a little piece of a starfish. You can see. This right here is kind of one of the, the one of the arms. And of course a shark tooth. And this is a sea urchin. I think it's uh Kato Pygsis Williamsi. For those of you who've been going back and forth with me on echinoids. And probably the prettiest crab claw I have ever seen at least locally this is one of my favorite bivalves this is an oyster called agarostrea falcata they're these wonderful ruffly things and I have a bazillion of them and I keep picking them up anyway kept picking them up anyway sniff still haven't gotten over the fact that it's closed and this is another snail. This is a gastropod called Laxispera lumbricalis. This little thing has been the bane of my existence for the last two years, and we're going to get to that story. There's a question, Heather, in the chat. Yes. Uh, how old might these be? This site is about 68 million years old. So this was about... Two million years, approximately. Everybody's still not quite sure exactly about the dating. There's been a lot of dis debate about it, but about two million years before the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. So where do I come in on all this? Um, I was volunteering with the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science, photographing and doing some taxonomy, identification work on various mollusks, um, including my own donations. I was working on fossil shells from Florida, which are a bit younger than this, actually considerably younger than this. They were Pliocene and Pleistocene. And I made a large donation to the Museum of fossil shells from Calvert Cliffs, which is an ongoing project of mine. There are something like, oh, last count, it was close to 70 species, but I've got a lot more on my table I got to work on yet. So I've been working on with fossils and shells in general at the museum for a while. And when Sophie donated her material the year before she passed away, they said, hey, would you like to play with this stuff? And I'm like, oh, yes, please. So um, because of my familiarity with really Reedy Point spoils and my enthusiasm, because I just love playing with this stuff, I got the job of turning these bags of random loosely assorted fossils into... Oh, randomly assorted fossils into something slightly more organized. You can see I wasn't quite sure about a lot of this stuff, and I'm still not sure about a lot of this stuff. I have half a drawer full of things that I still can't identify, but it's not for lack of trying. I think this is actually part of the Alexa Spirit project I've been working on. This is my workstation. I end up doing... I end up using a lot of different resources with this. It's a combination of anything I can find online, along with all kinds of out-of-print books, 
which haven't been digitized yet. So I've got stuff from New Jersey. I've got stuff from Delaware. I've got stuff from, well, everywhere from New Jersey down to North Carolina, as far as the Atlantic Coastal Plain. But this is also a correlate to the shells in the Western Interior Seaway, which I think is the next slide. Yes. So if we're right around here, this is actually Wilmington, Delaware. We actually shared a coastline with Texas and Tennessee and Mississippi. So a lot of my work comes from research out of this area over here because that was more heavily studied. The stuff from Delaware is so slim, you can actually, the books are actually like a quarter of an inch thick. There, so it's there's so little understood about this stuff. So what Sophie can Sophie donated has been a huge help in trying to figure out what everything was like. Because it was a tropical environment, there was a lot more speciation than there would be in, say, Delaware today. We don't, we can go out on the beach and it's not hard to identify what washes up on the Delaware beach. If it's a moon snail, it's probably one species of moon snail all along the beach, say for the coquinas, the whelks, that kind of thing. Sophie's collection. So far, I've cataloged almost 200 species of snails from one site. Just incredibly rich. So the real story begins when I was out at Reedy Point one day and found the shell cast. doesn't look like much but it's kind of distinctive unlike most of the shells I had seen it's got a very very small whorl up here and then it gets a lot bigger really quickly you can almost but not quite see here that as it gets bigger it starts to separate from the shell it, the coils start to unwind so I said, okay, this ought to be a real easy one to figure out. It wasn't. I did find this illustration in a book from 1907. And this looks pretty close to it. Big problem is that both the shell in this illustration and my shell are internal casts. There's no information about what the actual shell looked like. This is just the inside of the shell. So we really don't know whether this bit right here was where the shell thickened or if it really did peel away. We don't know what kind of ornament was on it. And this picture doesn't even show me what the opening that the snail came out of looked like. And this is the only specimen that I could find in this book or in another book that was written about New Jersey in 1963. They both used the same specimen. So I contacted a friend of mine down in Florida by the name of Bill Shankle, who is the editor of the Journal of the Delaware Valley Paleontological Society, and who was working on his own series of monographs on the shells of the Atlantic Coastal Plain. I said, hey Bill, have you seen anything like this? And he said, yeah, I've seen one. There is exactly one known specimen. It's in the New Jersey State Museum. That little mold is all we've got of Delphinula navicincensis. Like, okay, so all I've got are these horrible illustrations. And I really want to know what this thing is now because that's what I do and I've got a mystery to solve. So I contacted the curator of mollusks over at the New Jersey State Museum, David Paris, and sent him pictures and said, 
could you please tell me if these are a match for your little specimen there? And he came back and said, yeah, that's as close as we can possibly come with an internal mold. We can't make any bigger determination because there isn't any ornament. But it's a pretty close match for internal mold, for an internal cast. So like, yay, we've got two now. There are, this is a thing. It's not just an anomaly. There are two of this thing. And I turned and offered it to my collection manager who rightly challenged me and said, what makes you think that you found something that rare? And I thought about it for half a second and said, you know, I don't think it's that rare. I think that it just hasn't been documented. That this is an internal mold. So we don't know what it looked like on the outside. We, we could have could be seeing lots of them and not even recognize it because they have shells on them and this doesn't. It's a gastropod. And most people who go out to the canal are looking for pretty golden bullet shaped uh, bellum nights and great big oysters. And they're not looking for something that's half an inch wide. They are not looking for something that doesn't have any detail. Most people don't go looking for teeny tiny snail shells when they go fossil hunting. I'm just, I know I'm weird. I'm just, I'm just weird like that. But this is what I figured. I figured that somewhere in people's garages, there are probably a bazillion of these things. We just didn't know. So a few months later, guess what I found in Sophie's collection? I found three of these. And they were sitting by themselves. And she also came up with Delphinula navicincensis. I'm like, hey, cool. And you know what else? There are bits and pieces you can't really see in this image because, because I think it was on the back on this one. But there was actually shell material attached to this. So I said, hey, Bill, cool. We have some ornament to go with. We've actually got some new information about this thing. He's like, all right, I want to see this. So we started started working on, on really looking at this thing. A couple of months later, it got a little bit more confusing. These are not Delphinia navicincensis. These are part of a lot of some 200 shells that Sophie had identified as Laxispera lumbricalis. They were in lots of different bits and pieces. They had different ornaments on them. And I spent a crazy amount of time till my eyeballs just were permanently crossed trying to decide what was what. Some of these have finely beaded ornaments. Some of these have very, really close solid lines. Some of these have really broad bands. Some of them start out really tightly coiled at the top. Some of them, well, actually that one is pretty loose. This is a loose one. Some of these start out really co tightly coiled at the top and then unwind. Some of these start out very loose. So I was trying to figure out how to separate these. And as I looked at these, I'm like, you know what? I'm wondering if the reason we didn't recognize those delphinulas is because the delphinia was a broken top off of one of these things. So this, these three right here with the blue dots are what is described as a laxispira. We've got the beaded one here is laxispira. Uh, oh, good grief. I can't even remember the name now. This is Lumbricalis. This one is, I. she is drawing a blank tonight. 
that were divided out in 1963 by Norman Soul. You see, they have, aside from the ornament, they're pretty consistent. They have a very consistent uncoiling. They start out completely unwound and just keep on going. And come to find out that Lexispera lumbricalis, the original species, was only described by two internal casts and one complete shell. So we don't didn't have any more information with this than we did with the delphinula. Meanwhile, if you take a look at the top here, there are some other shells that are completely different part of the taxonomic tree. These are called Callium phallus, and they have very similar ornament, but all of them are what we call sutured because the whorls end up touching each other as they go around. And well, darn if this doesn't look like some of these as well. It's just these all had three whorls, and these are described as having five, which would make them separate species. But they look an awful lot alike. This is a better shot of the delphinula, the one normally known delphinula recorded until I came along anyway, uh, from the Jersey State Museum. And you can see that it's uncoiling here, just like the last, so last slide. And if you see over here, the opening for the animal to come out is about the same shape as the Laxispiras. You can see right there where the opening is. Heather, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know. Oh, never mind. I was going to say there was a question about zooming out on the PowerPoint, but apparently that question has been retracted. So oh, we're good. Okay. <laughs> As you were, never mind. All righty. So when I got the pictures here, I will have to stop and thank now Alex Kittle, who was kind enough to arrange for me to go and visit and photograph this image over at the New Jersey State Museum and the New Jersey State Museum for letting me in. Um, yeah, there. So this looks an awful lot like the Laxus spirits. There was only one small problem. This is too big. These right here are about the whole thing is about the same size as what looks like it should be the broken top of one of those shells. So I ended up back at the drawing board. Oh, and also we're still back to the original description was totally completely unwound. David Dockery in Mississippi managed to solve this problem for me. This is one of the Lexus spirits he had at the uh, Mississippi Geological Survey. And you can see that this Lexus spirit has the same coiled, what we call a protoconch. This is, this is how this snail started out when it was first hatched, this little bit up here. And then after the protoconch, it starts unwinding. Interestingly enough, and I hadn't noticed this until after I wrote my paper, this one has one, two, three, four, five whorls. So I took those 200 shells and I lined them up. I lined them up and tried to sort them out and figure out how many different species I had in front of me by arranging the, well, these are really long and skinny and these are short and fat and these are tightly coiled and these aren't so tightly coiled. And what I ended up with instead was this continuum. It's, I've got some that start out really tightly coiled 
and then start to unwind. This is another one of, the, one of Sophie's delphinulas. And you can see here, some of them start out really tightly coiled and then start to unwind. And, uh, but in more, more of a column rather than like a teepee kind of thing. Some of them are, would fit straight up and down, but this one is angled. So it's kind of curves around here. Some of them are really tall and skinny. Some of them are really irregular. And even the shoulders are kind of odd. You can see that all of these have some kind of angled shoulder that stops at some point and then just kind of curves around the bottom. And this one, it's really steep and then suddenly drops around. But what all they all have in common is three whorls. They unwind as they grow and they have some sort of spiral ribbing. So this leaves a whole lot of questions. Are these all the same species? If not, how many species do they represent? Is, is Delphinella navisinkensis a cast of Alexispira? Is Calium phalaeus a misidentified member of this group? I don't know. And that is something that we're going to have to figure out down the road. So why do we even care about this? First of all, most gastropods have a very consistent shape. If you see one moon snail, the rest of the species are going to have more or less that same shape. If you see a turritella, most of you are probably familiar with turritellas, the ornament changes, but within a species, it's all going to be the same shape and it's all going to be the same ornament. These things have some kind of crazy, very wild variation, which doesn't happen very often. The only other snail I know of that has this kind of irregular individual growth is something called a siliquaria. And that's because the siliquarias were growing inside of plants or around coral branches or something like that, where they're just kind of winding their way through the gaps. But we don't have any evidence of anything like that going on at this site. So the big question is, why is it doing this? On a different level, science is only as good as the data in which it's based. The Delphinula was based on a single specimen. The Laxisperias were based on three specimens, two of which didn't have any ornament. In vertebrate paleontology, it is a regular thing that if you find a couple of bones that don't seem to match anything else, it's automatically a new species. And it brings in a whole lot of fights. Ask a vertebrate paleontologist about Tyrannosaurus rex versus Nanotyrannus and watch the fur fly. With invertebrate paleontology, we usually get away from that kind of thing. The, the guideline is now more like you have to have at least three of something to describe it as a species. But clearly, in this case, even three isn't necessarily enough. So this kind of underscores that the more information we have, the better idea we're going to have of what we're looking at. And that's true whether it's a snail, a dinosaur, or pretty much anything else in science. The more data you've got, 
the more likely you are to come up with the right answer. Another important point that I really want to emphasize is that private collections are important. Sophie Humsey was a self-taught private individual who had a passion for her fossils and buried her nose in every book she could get a hold of to figure out what she had. She took notes, she did illustrations, she kept track of everything. And now we have this wonderful collection because she donated it when she passed away. And this is important because first of all, institutions don't have the space or the funding or any other resources to collect everything in the world. But if we have people who are very serious in their collecting, not just throwing it in jars, but really keeping an eye on what's out there and learning and documenting, then we can all work together. Second of all, what paid science ignores today may become important tomorrow. Let's face it, right now, the only things that are getting any kind of money are dinosaurs because they're exciting and they bring people into the museum, climate science, and um, looking for oil. We use foraminifera, which are our single cell organisms to figure out where there might be oil deposits. But that's pretty much where the funding's going right now. So if we've got these people who are going, hey, wow, this is really cool. I wanna learn more about this stuff and I'm gonna hold on to this. Maybe somebody else will be interested. Then odds are down the road, somebody's going to be. And of course, when localities close, like the canal did, collections are all we have to study. You know, I keep doing the present tense with the, with the canal because I still can't believe it's gone. I can't go play there anymore. But I have years and years worth of stuff to go through both at Sophie's collection and my own personal collection. And it's the canal is going to last because we have the stuff that we collected before it was gone. And finally, amateurs are important. Amateurs are PR, the amateurs can contribute to science just as much as paid paleontologists can. We may not necessarily have the resources, we may not have CAT scanners and scanning electron microscopes, or even a really good quality couple thousand dollar microscope, but we can do something. The real difference between an amateur paleontologist and a professional paleontologist functionally is that the professionals are getting paid. Some of them have a lot more experience, but experience is just a matter of trucking until you learn what to learn what you need to learn. Discoveries are made all the time by observant children. You've probably seen stuff in the newspapers at least once a year where some kid was out west at one of the national parks and tripped over a bone and said, hey, Mr. Park Ranger, I found something. And darned if it wasn't a new species. Institutions often rely on amateurs to make sense of boxes of stuff in the collections, especially when the specimens are in the staff's realm of it out of the staff's realm of expertise. I gotta tell you that most of the museums that I've been dealing with, the staff are all vertebrate paleontologists. They're looking at sharks and dinosaurs and marine reptiles and all these wonderful toothy monsters. And if I ask them about a shell, they don't really know. Uh, most of the stuff that I work with is out of their experience. So I and all kinds of other avocational folks, and I'm looking at you, Adrian, we'll go to these museums and say, hey, can you play around with your stuff for a while? And we'll go and identify and 
identify what they've got in their collections, organize it, so correct misidentified shells and that kind of thing, because we can. And amateurs are free to study things that grants won't fund. Back to all the money is going right now to dinosaurs, climate science, and finding oil. So on that note, I really want to encourage you to try to help. Best ways you can help are, first of all, to read and educate yourself. Learn about what you're looking for. Learn about what's out there before you go out so that you know what you're looking at. Can you identify the difference between a rock and a dolphin ear bone? Can you tell the difference between a brachiopod and a clam? Do we even know what a brachiopod is? These are the kinds of things that you want to go out before you go out in the field. And then read again after you've come back from the field and figure out what you've got in front of you. You need to write when and where you found everything and what you notice. No collection is of any use to anyone if you do not know where it came from. I cannot emphasize that enough. That is the most important question of all because that will determine the age of the item and the species. You're not going to find a Loxyspira in the middle of something from the Paleozoic era. Ask questions. Science starts with questions. Everything is about trying to come up with questions and trying to come up with answers. And usually when you're looking for the answers, you end up more with, with more questions than you started with. If you can find somebody who knows the answer, fantastic. You just found a mentor. If they can't figure out the answer either, then maybe one or the, both of you need to go look deeper and try to find the answer. And finally, if no one else is interested, but it interests you, keep it and study it. Because you never know down the road who is going to be interested in it. And I'll leave you with one little regret of mine that I'm working on right now. I uh, occasionally go out to the Delaware shore and pick up tumbled, worn out, really old cobbles with Paleozoic fossils in them. These are our stuff that predate the dinosaurs. And they didn't occur on the land where we find them. They were actually washed down from somewhere. And we have our guesses as approximately where. But I used to pick these up and go, hey, cool, look at this. This is really cool. This is really, really old. I really like this. This is really cool. Oh, oops, sorry. I was trying to me was messing around with my screen share and it didn't work. Oh, there we go. So I'm sitting here going, this is really cool. Look at this. I like this. I, this is so awesome. And it's really, really old. And where did it come from? I don't know. And it was like, ah, oh, that's just an erratic. We don't know where it came from. We don't know how old it is. It's not worth looking at. So finally, I said, okay, whatever. And threw them all in a jar. Stuff from four different beaches along the Delaware shore. Wouldn't you know, somebody from New Jersey is asking me now if I would please photograph all my stuff so he can use them for his study, trying to figure out all the stuff came from. If it interests you, keep it, study it. Somebody else will be interested eventually. <laughs> and that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? That was so cool. Less of a question than a comment, but that was so cool. Thank you. I'm going to throw the link to the uh, raffle in the chat again, just because, you know. So there are a couple of questions coming up here. Cody just said something. 
Cody loves your passion. George uh, had something to say about the Inland Sea. Um, what's a brachiopod? I feel like I, I do know, but I feel like I, I don't really. <laughs> a brachiopod looks like a clam on the outside and looks like a barnacle on the inside. They have their own phylum in the animal kingdom. And that's, yeah, instead of being a slimy thing on the inside, they have feeding arms. They go and 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 kind of whisk stuff in to grab. Um, there are they are still around. We don't see them very often today because they tend to be in very very deep cold water, except in Australia. And again, the stuff in Australia isn't going to wash up on our beaches. Right. But in the Paleozoic, there were actually a lot more brachiopods than there were mollusks, and the, and the gastropods and the clams and the oysters and cephalopods, all of those are mollusks. So they're a completely different part of the taxonomic tree. Thank you. Questions? I guess that means you uh, addressed everyone's questions and you uh, fully explained everything that there is to know about this topic. Uh, what Heather, is next that's in the Alexi Spira project? Are you going to try to re-describe the genus with a there different species? Yes, I'm going to try, but I haven't haven't gotten that far yet, and I need to. It's kind of on hold right now because I still have a lot of species gastropods to get through, and if I stop and dive down the rabbit hole. Every time I have one of these mysteries, then Alex is going to kill me. <laughs> and I know he's listening. Um, but yeah, I really want to figure out what this is and redescribe the Laxity Spears based on the variation. And I've talked to the folks at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philly, and they be trying to help me with some scanning and that kind of thing to get a better idea of the inside and outside of the shells. Can you provide the link to the museums? Um, which museums were you interested in, Adrian? The museums that might that have this collection that you've been looking at. Um, this one, this stuff that I've been, specifically the research project I'm working on is all at the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science. What town is that in? It's in Greenville, Delaware. Anywhere close to CND Canal? Mm, about half hour, forty five minutes north. Okay, thank you. If you want to send me a link to that later, Heather, I can share it with the attendees of this meeting, if that's okay. easier. That would be great. Ah, Jennifer just sounds, added Sounds like a road trip. Yeah, um, somebody from the museum just, just posted our website. Why are, were there more brachiopods? That is an excellent question. And I think the answer is that they evolved first. I'm not entirely sure because I'm not as well versed in the Paleozoic, but I think it was mostly a case of they evolved first. Mm, looks like things are quiet there. That was really interesting. I, I appreciate your attention to the role of amateurs because, you know, the Natural History Society, we're all about amateurs. None exactly. of us have, you and know, I'm exactly. an amateur. Yeah, right. It, it, and, and the things that get funded are, as you said, the things that have sort of practical applications. Um, and there's still definitely a role for just curiosity and just people being like, wow, this is cool. What's the deal with this? Let's figure it out. Um, and I, I hope that people continue to follow their enthusiasm and, and devote their expertise to this sort of thing as you did. That was great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Any other questions? Last call here. Appreciate all your time. Uh, in September, we'll be back to in-person meetings uh, and, you know, um, 
that should be pretty cool. So, but that was really neat. Thank you, Heather, so much. Appreciate <laughs> it. Take care, everybody. <laughs>